Welcome to the first ever Ask SFN show. Uh, this is a show where we bring the biggest names in sport, fitness and nutrition to the couch. We present them with your questions through social media using the hashtag Ask SFN show. I'm actually a bit of a useless middleman here. You probably could have done this yourself with the camera and, and Ben. <laughs> it's very fitting that Ben is our first guest given that he has been a headliner of the show since the first year. That was 2014, he was back in 2015, he's now back again this year for the 2016 show in August, which he'll be presenting two seminars at. Ben, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, is a performance nutritionist. He has the number one health and fitness podcast on iTunes. It's the Ben Kuma Radio, which is nearing 200 episodes, is Nearly. it? Nearly, yeah, at time of filming, we're on 185. Nice. Nice. So, if anybody didn't know who he was at this point, then you've got a, it. a lot of content to to catch up on. Um, he's also the founder of Body Type Nutrition. So, whether you're a fitness professional or interested in nutrition, expand your knowledge. That's definitely something for you to to look up at. And you can also speak to him about it at ISFN as well. So, well, first of all, I'm actually going to completely off the bat. I'm going to ruin the concept of the show, which is you're supposed to ask the questions. I watched your Confessions podcast just a few days ago. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It was a, quite a random piece of content. Um, I watched it on Facebook, so the, the video version. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just you speaking to your laptop for 45 minutes. But yeah. you talked about yourself, where you came from, when you were obese, when you were younger, how you progressed through that into the fitness industry. Um, what, how your minds changed and your perceptions of the industry and your knowledge over the past 10 years mm -hmm. or however long. Um, for anybody that hasn't seen it, first of all, go and watch it. Second of all, can you expand a wee bit on that? Yeah, so 10 years I've been in the industry now and you know, you are, you learn an awful lot in 10 years and when I look back at it, you kind of think, wow, Jesus, where, where's 10 years gone? And you know, I wanted people. I wanted to be able to reflect and share with people how I've evolved as an individual, both um, as a consumer and transferring my knowledge into then becoming a personal trainer, and then transferring that into becoming an educator and doing public speaking and trying to inspire greater change. And for me, in the fitness industry, there's a huge, um, huge lack of dis uh, honesty. You know, there's a lot of people trying to sell an awful lot of stuff and. You know, being an educator, I have to kind of build rapport with people. I owe it to people to be honest with people. Um, and, you know, I have, to, I have to be real about everything that I'm doing. There's a huge a lot of, there's a huge amount of fakeness in the fitness industry. We tend to focus on the abs and the muscles and the fat loss and the supplements and stuff. And all of that's great. I know that's selling stuff, but I'm trying to facilitate change. And change comes from the right information applied in the right environment for the right individual. And you know the fitness industry tells us tends to sell things on a black and white outcome. And every one of the people watching this right now, you and me, we have dynamics outside of fitness that we have to bear in mind. Like, why do we ever choose to become fitter? We do it to enrich our life, to be able to move better, to be able to feel better, to look better naked, to have a better sex life. I don't know what it is. But, you know, fitness has become something that's actually become very unrealistic and untangible. And for me, I want to bring it back, back down to why do we learn about fitness? What does fitness affect in our lives? And how is it going to help us build a better, more awesome life? Awesome. So I just spent 45 minutes, as you say, going over my whole journey, what I've learned, what I've changed, uh, why my opinions change, what I now teach what I now know is not true and hold my hands up and gone actually our opinions change based on research experience whatever it might be and to show that everyone is going to go through that journey they can't automatically take my knowledge and be 10 years you know ahead I'm just trying to shortcut people's journeys and open you know I don't really see myself as an educator per se I see myself as a facilitator I don't want to say to you this is right this is wrong I want to say Here's some facts, and this is how I want you to try and transfer it in your life. This is how it could change things for you. Nice. So, do you think that your opinions changed over the last 10 years because you're a practitioner and actually using the stuff you do, or is it through research and new findings? Bit of both. Um, you know, 
a very on-trend topic in the fitness industry right now is is it research proven is there evidence to support this claim and stuff and all of that is brilliant like evidence and science and research needs to ground our opinions it needs to um, make us stand back and be rational about something but everything needs to be applied in practice like does it actually hold water um, how does it affect an environment we're trying to apply it to like we could we could start to talk about something really geeky that a lot of people might be interested in like carbohydrate metabolism fat metabolism how proteins used by a muscle great but does it really matter how all that stuff works in the grand scheme of a diet when really we need to eat this we need to eat that in the right proportion we need to calorie control it and some people are blowing things up into such a specific level that it holds no relevancy to what people actually need to learn. Nikki wants to know what can gym rats learn from rugby? Probably two things. Um, it's a long standing joke on the podcast. I play rugby. Um, so people that watch the podcast might smile at that. I think two things rugby, I've worked in professional sport, I've worked in amateur sport and rugby, and one thing rugby is great at is applying the minimal effective dose to kind of training nutrition lifestyle everyone's got this perception that an athlete does loads of everything all the time and that's how they look great and you know that's how they get so much outcome but in the reality the athlete tries to do as little as possible to get the outcome and always manage their recovery their health their mindset because um, otherwise you're going to kind of burn out and in the fitness industry there's a great trend of do more do more get a better result and that's rarely the case like I look at some people's training plans and they're doing cardio in the morning weights in the evening four times a week and then they're doing sprint training at the weekend because they're trying to lose body fat or you know and it's usually fat loss related and I'm like you're just burning yourself out on every level you don't have time for your home life you don't have time for your kind of work life you're losing sight of why you actually got into this in the first place more doesn't mean better and in rugby and i've worked in a couple of premiership clubs in terms of just being in their environment um and kind of help, helping them a little bit you know people always say oh ben what do they do in the clubs and i'm like well the guys will come in monday morning they might do um, a lower body strength session wednesday they might do an upper body strength session and that's it and they're like, what? They're not in the gym three, four, five days a week. Some players might be. Some players that aren't playing as much rugby. Some players that take their fitness and nutrition into their own hands. Like I've done some work here and there with uh, James Haskell, um, good friend of mine. You know, he trains a bit more than other rugby players do, but he has a personal ambition. He has a bit more of an, an, an aesthetic ambition tied into that. So he might be in the gym more than other people, but a rugby player knows that they need to get in the gym to be stronger to be better on the rugby pitch and that's it and that doesn't mean they need to do you know 30 sets of a squat they might get that dose or the dose that they need by doing four sets or the stimulus and that's absolutely fine so that's one thing that more doesn't equal better in fitness like I'm in the gym three or four days a week and that's great for me I improve my strength I improve my aesthetics um, and I don't I don't think that I have to do more to be able to achieve that I think the second thing with, from rugby is that, and this is probably the fitness industry has perpetuated this over time, is that leaner is always better. Like, oh, look at that guy. He's really lean. He must be athletic. He must be healthy. He must be fitter. Um, you know, he must get you know, more chicks in the bar or whatever. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Like, a rugby player will tend to operate mm, some at 10%, but like... 12 14 16 percent body fat because they know that that extra fat um actually helps them in terms of energy during the last minutes of the game it's going to help absorb impact and really being really lean you know being lean yes will help you be more mobile because you're not carrying as much weight but there's only so far that kind of theory goes um so you know most rugby players are big strong powerful healthy you know happy and I, that's, I know that's a generalization but you know they're operating in a zone that makes them happy that provides for this sport it's not just about the aesthetics and you know and I just want people to stand back and think about why do I train why do I hit the gym why do I eat the way that I do what are my goals and to stop thinking about the kind of extreme result of fitness and this is my 
in a way a pet peeve a little bit with the bodybuilding side of our industry and you know people that do that's absolutely fine but if we look at the extreme of bodybuilding there's a lot of really bad orthorexic ha habits in bodybuilding that do isn't actually conductive to a really happy healthy lifestyle like some of the, the choices that we make around food that like we have to train at a certain time and one of the beauties of me of being only being in the gym three days a week is actually I can pick and choose the days I might be in the gym where if I've got a five, six day a week training program, man, I need to be in the gym pretty much every day of the week. That doesn't offer me much flexibility of my lifestyle. Um, what about if my work schedule gets busy? So again, I'm, I'm drawing on conclusions, but we need to be critical and ask ourselves why we do the things that we do and are they leading to an outcome that we expect or want? Right. Well, co coming back to uh, Nikki's uh, terminology of gym rat, so I'm guessing she's talking about people who are five, six days a week, would you say the majority of gym rats are overdoing it then? Maybe. Like if, if you're doing something and you're getting an outcome that you want and you appreciate and you're enjoying the journey, then that's providing for you. But if you're a gym rat and you don't have the body composition that you want and it's not actually making you that happy, you're not enjoying it as much as you thought, then you have to stand back and say that the tools that you're using to try and get to where you want to are actually broken. You know, if we don't enjoy the journey, like I loved my weight loss journey because it empowered me, I saw myself getting stronger and fitter and happier, and all the tools that I use I came to appreciate, but over time I stopped using those tools because I didn't have a connection that they were being positive in my journey of getting me from A to B, so I had to shift that. And a lot of us are not shifting what we're using to get from A to B when we've, we've maybe gone through that journey because we're not re-evaluating, we're not stepping back. So, and this is why I'm a big lover of sport. It doesn't matter what you do, whether it's badminton or rugby or football or boxing, like sport teaches you um, so many different things and it's inclusive, you're around people, it's competitive. And that's why, you know, a lot of healthy habits come out of the gym, but there's also a massive amount of healthy habits that can be done outside the gym. So this is going from Bronwyn Doherty. What advice would you give to somebody who has lost motivation and can't seem to get back on track? Well, it probably links a lot to the last question in that if you're not motivated to do something, what you think you're trying to achieve isn't really the goal. Like that's why when people ask, uh, people speak to me about their goals and they'll say, "Oh Ben, I'm trying to lose weight." Uh, what should I do? And I'm like, hang on a second, weight loss is a crap goal. And I say it's crap, it is the end goal, but what does that weight loss look like? What does it feel like? What, what, how is it tangible? What will that weight loss equal? So for someone that's struggling with their weight loss goal, what is actually firing them up to eat less, to go to bed on time, to go to the gym, all that kind of stuff? So you have to ask yourself harder questions. Well. I want to lose weight because I want to be able to run around in the gardens after my kids and I want to be able to move better. I don't want to feel my belly jiggling my clothes anymore. Um, I want to have a better sex life. I want to feel more confident. All that kind of stuff, when you sit there and think, mm, should I go to the gym? Now you're weighing up all those factors that feed into weight loss rather than going, I want to lose weight, but I should go to the gym. Ah, I won't bother. But when you're like, well, I'm not going to feel more confident, I'm not going to be able to run around with my kids in the garden, I'm not going to feel happier and healthier and more confident. When you start to compare it against that, that actually makes a very compelling argument. And when I lost weight, as an example, my journey was actually very powerful. At the time, I was going to try and, powerful and simple, but probably powerful in its simplicity, I was going to go and be an actor and go to drama school. And I said to myself, I cannot be fat and go to drama school. I will not get as much work. So me being fat questioned the whole of my career or potential career at that time. Because I said, I'm not going to get the good gigs. I'm not going to be able to dance. I'm not going to be able to kiss the girl because that doesn't happen in those kind of scenes. And already I just had a, such a fire in my belly that I am going to lose weight because my career depends on it. And that was a very simple guided goal. So the weight loss was something that would affect my whole life. Nice. Well, something that a lot of people will be interested in, I would assume, is from somebody who who teaches this stuff, does this stuff still happen to you? Do you ever lose motivation uh, yourself? No, no. never. Because if I'm going on any journey in my life, A to B, B to C, C to D, I just 
realign things. Like if I get to a place, if I don't change my journey, I'm, I'm going to stop, I'm going to fault up because I haven't realigned my goals. So you need to be really clear on where you're going and what you're trying to get to. And when you get there, you need to you need to be positive. So most people are not positive enough when they get somewhere like, oh, I've got my weight loss, I've done this. You know, almost congratulate yourself, pat on the back. But now we need to realign things. So, you know, let's realign my goals. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to start training like this and I'm going to go and find this person because they can help me facilitate this next part of my journey. So my my motivation never wanes because I, I change things but I'm just as an individual I'm just hungry for life like I mentioned being awesome at the beginning of this like I want to lead an awesome life and that motivates me to do cool stuff have adventure be successful in my career have happy relationships be healthy feel amazing every day and for me come on cool shows and stuff as well. come on cool shows like this for me that's enough to get up every day and take the right action yeah. And I almost, sometimes I can't comprehend when people are just not fired up about living their best life. I just don't get it. I don't get how you could sit there and not want to make the best decision to take your life forward in a positive way. Yeah. And if you feel you can't make that decision in your environment, then you need to change your environment. That, that's a good tip. Do, do you write out your goals? Like I do, yeah. I have a goal board in my office at home. So when I walk through the door in my office, it's right there in front of me. My goal board's always uh, visual. So there's a photo and then there's some writing on the photo of what that goal means. And then I have a yearly planner. Well, it's actually a three-year planner. And then I have the photos on a timeline. So let's say um, like two years ago, I wanted to buy a house for my girlfriend. Um, and so I put it on my goal board, like what do I need to do to save up for a deposit for a house and how did that look, da da da. Now, translating that back to health and fitness, if I put an image up of a guy with abs, okay, to lose two stone, what do I have to do in that time frame to get to look like that guy? So I'll draw it on a timeline and then I have a yearly planner, monthly planner, weekly planner and daily planner. And if I'm sitting there in my day-to-day -day life and I make an action that I can't translate back to a goal, then I have to be honest and say I should stop doing this action. And that's the same with fitness, career, health, whatever whatever it might be. If you're doing stuff day to day and it's not getting you closer towards your goal, then why are you doing it? Nice. And that's a brutal reality of how people operate. That too much of us get stuck in routine, stuck in reality, and this is a thing for females. Women are very good way more so than men at doing things for other people and there's loads of people spinning their wheels that I, I speak to and they're like I'm not achieving my goals but everyone's doing so much for other people I'm like when do your goals get a look in when do you start doing things for yourself good way of looking at things the the next the next one came from somebody called Stephen Iden don't know if you know him no not, not maybe no. I'll meet him no. this year yeah possibly so it's well documented your 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 series on herbal life uh, <laughs> that that you did a few years ago. Um, I actually noticed um, that if if you go onto YouTube onto your channel mm -hmm. and then you go to your most viewed videos, yeah, like all of them are quite close. The herbal life videos, yeah, yeah. There's shotgun. If any of you haven't watched them, it involves a shotgun, a sledgehammer, a rugby post, and something else. Yeah. It's not pretty. I think, I think it was uh, using it as gym chalk. Oh, maybe, yeah. Herbalife is good gym chalk. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, so he asks, what are your views on Herbalife now? Do you know, I've never had a problem with Herbalife per se, and I don't want to be defamatory against this. So, we'll, we'll capture all meal replacement shakes in the same um, category. For me, meal replacement shakes are a fact that most of these companies will advertise them you know selling kind of a dream like if you take this meal replacement shake for breakfast and for lunch and have a normal meal in the evening then you're going to achieve weight loss and you're going to be healthier and whatever and to a degree that is entirely true like but the the thing that it's changing in your life is it's calorie restricting it's making it really easy to calorie restrict your diet which is great to a degree but at what point do we transition off the shake at what point do we learn about real food and how it affects the body and calories and that kind of stuff? So for me, there's an awful lot of people selling this stuff 
not ever educating the person about their body, about food, about why they got overweight in the first place. And that's kind of my big beef. You're seeing these incredible claims and things on the internet about meal replacement shake companies. And it's like, when is that person just going to educate? And it might be a slow burn. I might make, you know, I might support my income 10 times slower than someone selling a meal replacement shake. But I'm going to do it with ethic, uh, ethics, integrity, honesty, and I'm going to make long term change. I don't believe that I'm going to make long term change selling someone a meal replacement shake. I believe I'm going to make change by educating them, empowering them, showing them, teaching them skills that they can take till their deathbed. And that's my big problem with those kind of companies. Okay. So, so it was never it was never a problem with supplementation. It was a problem with the the way it's sold. Yeah, the ethics and the way that people are selling this stuff. And you know, there's many of these companies that are getting people to just sell the shakes, and they're not qualified on fitness and nutrition advice. Like I've seen some people uh, make absolutely wild claims about how these products can help people, and I'm like, you can't say that, and you're also not qualified to say that. Like, you know, people might be doing this on the side of their full-time job or by day I'm an accountant and by night I'm a meal replacement shake salesman it's like hang on a second like I'm, I'm qualified to give out the advice that I give and I do it in an ethical sustainable and kind of safe way and I have a responsibility to do that and a lot of these people don't do that they see it as a paycheck mm -hmm. so next question is from Christy Bridge any tips for someone who struggles with binge eating tough topic and I'm gonna advise you to look up people that might be a bit more qualified in this this kind of area but you know binge eating for me comes down sometimes to two factors one of the factors is, is that we don't understand the dynamics and some of the science-based application of nutrition so there's a trend in you fit in, in the fitness industry called clean eating or paleo and that kind of stuff and this system of teaching tends to say that if you eat clean everything will be okay is in you'll lose body fat you'll be healthier etc and to a degree that's true in a way um but it's how people apply it like the calorie balance or ca the calorie equation still has to be played into you maintaining body composition or losing and gaining weight so the problem with this kind of diet concept of clean eating is it is still a diet because you're still living to a framework and you don't have a secondary framework so that if you step out of plan a which is clean eating there is no plan b so if i'm someone that only eats clean all the time and i get to a point in time where i'm a bit fed up i'm a little bit low on energy friends come around for a movie and they've brought popcorn and maltesers and all that kind of stuff you've got a choice is that going to fit into your framework of eating or do you stop, put it on hold and go and do what you want to do, which is go and eat Maltesers and eat popcorn with your friends and that kind of stuff. Now, that might have been a really pleasurable experience for you. Oh, I really enjoyed Maltesers. God, you know, it was nice to have a break from clean eating all the time. And because of that, we then might, that might spur a bit of a binge if we enjoy that. So the next day we go out for breakfast with our friends and then we do what we want for lunch. And then we have a couple of drinks in the evening. And all of a sudden this kind of warps itself into a weekend of doing what you want. And then Monday starts again and you're like, all oh, right, I better get back on the old clean eating bandwagon again. So people that binge eat they need to understand that there is a secondary framework i am someone that promotes 80 90 percent of your diet should be whole food the other 10 20 percent percent should be food that you enjoy that might not be optimal junk food processed food whatever you want to call it um you know eating out alcohol that kind of stuff because that's part of living a normal sociable lifestyle you go out for dinner i go out for dinner i play rugby at the weekend and have a couple of pints with my mates that doesn't have to be detrimental to my body composition or my performance goals. So what do I do? I apply a secondary framework, which is that I know if I eat too many calories, I'll gain weight. So if I want three pints after my rugby match with the friends, I factor it into my intake. I might go, okay, well, the pint of beer is 150 calories. That's 450 calories of beer I'm going to drink today. I'm going to factor that into my total daily calorie allowance. And because I'm eating enough and a good amount of calories to support my goals, I eat around 3,500 calories a day, then actually that's quite easy to factor into my diet. I might eat a little bit lighter earlier on in the day and have something that I want at night. So that's the first thing. Make sure you're nailing that. And that is the science of nutrition. Secondly, you need to see whether you're 
you know, and identify whether you're, you know, finding comfort in food. Are we saying, oh, this food is satisfying something that I'm not getting in my lifestyle? And that's a really kind of quite sad place to be. And you need to be very reflective and honest with yourself and say, why am I finding comfort in food? And the chances are there's a situation that you need to resolve. There's an environmental issue you need to uh, um, resolve. And this just takes very painful steps. Like no one wants con confrontation. Sometimes no one likes change. And the reality is unless you change, unless you confront, unless you resolve a situation, you're not gonna be able to go forward positively. Now if those two things haven't helped people, then I would say you need to go and find someone that can help. You know, this isn't a specialty area of mine, so my comment can only go so far. But you know, um, Stephen Aish, uh, one of our coaches, Will Hawkins, uh, one of our BTN coaches, they talk on this subject a lot. Uh, and maybe pick up a couple of books. Maybe you might see a therapist if you think it's more emotional. I'm a big fan of seeking therapy if you don't have an answer to something. Like sometimes we need qualified people to help us extract what we need out of you know our, our mentality. So that would be my advice on that. Yeah. Is there really a need to give the adrenal glands a break by limiting caffeine intake if it doesn't impact sleep or cortisol adversity? So for me, the answer's in the question there. If you don't have an adverse effect, so if you're not sleeping badly, if your energy is not effective, if hormonally you feel good, then there's no reason to probably change anything. There's no point reading maybe me say something and go, oh, Ben said something about cortisol, perhaps I should you know, cut it all out. Or Ben said something about gluten, perhaps I should cut it all out. But if it's not actually, if there's not a problem there, then maybe it's not even worth exploring it. Now, if I was working with someone that had really poor sleep, um, they were suffering from a bit of fatigue during the day, their energy was very inconsistent, then I might look to limit caffeine intake because that's gonna play into um, how much um, a, you know, a cortisol and adrenaline we're pumping out of the body, which could be affecting their energy, it could be affecting other hormones, it could be affecting their sleep, which is a key player in regulating your hormones. So only do things if there's a problem, but you know, Caffeine is overconsumed by an awful lot of people. There's people that are you know, still drinking at five, six, seven, eight o'clock at night, and we're trying to go to bed, we're lying there awake, or we're restless, and we think why well, we can't get to sleep. So if something's negatively affecting something, then change it. If it's not, then probably don't worry about it. Is there a chance that, um, that this person has such a high caffeine intake that he's completely burnt out his adrenal glands and therefore it's gone into the other side of things where he can sleep like he can have a coffee before bed and he'll sleep and maybe maybe he should then be cutting back it could happen it's probably more unlikely um obviously you'd want to get a test to confirm that you wouldn't want to just assume that the more likely causes is that he's probably a non-responder that we know that genetically there's people that don't really respond to caffeine it doesn't affect them in some ways like if i have a cup of coffee I am wired for hours and I'm often quite jittery. It's not it's not very a pleasant feeling. It's another reason why I don't have caffeine in my diet much. Whereas you might have a cup of coffee and just not really feel anything. And it might be down to your genetics. Yeah. I drink tea all day. Mm. But if it doesn't affect anything, then you might think, well, cool. This is something I heard the other day. Is there more caffeine in tea than there is in coffee? Again, it depends on how you brew it, the strength <laughs> of the original brew, like, um, if you put coffee, um, so here's a different way of explaining it. Most people think espresso is the strongest form of caffeine. It's not. It's very quickly passed through in the, in the, in the process, and there's roughly about 60, 80 milligrams in a shot of espresso. Now, if I put the same amount of coffee in a cafetiere and left it for five minutes, it's gonna have a lot more time to assimilate that caffeine into the water. So if you left your tea bag in the cup for 10 minutes, you're gonna get way more caffeine out of the tea leaves than if you left it for one minute. So there's not really a black and white answer. It all depends on the brewing techniques, the strength of the caffeine in the original bean, but there are rough guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, but as a generalization, the way that we consume caffeine these days is probably more caffeine in coffee, because most of us are getting double shots in our Starbucks. We're having a venti coffee in Starbucks, we're naturally having three shots of espresso, and that's gonna be way more caffeine than in a, just a standard cup of builder's tea. Mm -hmm. Nice. Egg and Rose 
I am struggling with a new diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. My muscles twitch and exhausted all the time. I am particularly bad after I eat. I tried cutting out gluten, but that didn't make any difference. I think I should be eating small and often to minimize the fatigue after eating, but it is such a struggle to motivate myself to keep eating. It feels like a consistent struggle, not something I thought I'd ever say. I guess the question is, what advice would you give me for twitchy muscles and what would what would be good for lots of snacks and small meals? So there's a few questions. Yeah, so I'm not going to answer that, the last part of it because I honestly don't think it's relevant. I build nutrition to the individual, so you should always work out the foods that make you feel good in the right proportions and that's how you should self-assess a diet and move forward with it. To look at the actual problem, now this is obviously a, a diagnosis and I'm not a doctor or a dietitian. So, you know, when we're looking at chronic fatigue or anything like that, you've and any kind of problem, so let's take any symptom, let's say you've got eczema, let's say I've got IBS, let's say the cameraman, um, you know, has got migraines. Whatever the problem is, you've got to go right back down to raw health. Like you've got to look at every factor across the board of your health and say, what can I improve? Can I improve my sleep? Can I improve my hydration? Can I improve my fruit and veg intake? Is my protein intake consistent? Do I have foods in my diet that are inflammatory and causing adverse reactions? It could be gluten, eggs, dairy, it could be anything. I did an intolerance test the other day um, with a practitioner and all sorts of stuff came up and we went through a process of eliminating things and we did it based on you know multiple tests to try and get a, a mean bit of data. But if you're looking at your lifestyle and going, well actually I'm not sleeping properly and actually I don't drink enough water and actually I don't eat enough green leafy vegetables and all this kind of stuff, we need to get away from focusing on the problem and just look at our health globally. If you make a body immensely healthy it will start to fix itself it's like the argument between should we detox and should we not well, we should really be looking at detoxing if your diet is full of crap anyway like take the crap out and your body shouldn't have to start trying to detox all this kind of stuff if you had a healthy diet the body will naturally detox it you know um, the lymphatic system the liver they'll be doing all their jobs rather than you having to try and force its job so this is why I teach optimal health is the answer to everything look at food intolerances, look at sleep, look at training intelligently, look at stress, look at all that stuff. If you're doing all that, then I'd probably look up the work of Alex Manos. He's one of our coaches. He's just recently or over the last couple of years been specializing in chronic fatigue. So I'd maybe look at look him up. Um, but focus on health. It's the answer to everything. Nice. So you went to a practitioner to get tested for intolerances. Yeah. How can somebody else go and get that done i think the easiest way for most people to do is an elimination diet there's loads of information online to do it very simply you basically take out um, food groups that you think might be a problem and you reintroduce them and listen to the original symptoms so if i had ibs and i cut out a load of food my ibs went and i ate let's just say it's gluten and i ate a piece of bread and i got bloated i felt tired i had fatigue then you you pretty much know it's going to be that gluten. There are other ingredients in bread, for example, so you might just do it again, another test, you might just use completely flour, for example, and again, you're confirming the test. If you're not sure what foods to eliminate, maybe write a diet diary. Lunch, I had this. In the afternoon, oh, I felt awful, I had all my symptoms. So then look at lunch, what was in lunch? Oh, I had a ham sandwich, so what was in the ham sandwich? Gluten, pork, egg in the mayonnaise, maybe dairy, butter, you know, break down the components and say, okay, well in the next meal I'm going to try and have gluten just from pasta and I'm just going to put a simple tomato sauce on it. So now you've just got gluten and basically tomatoes to kind of weigh it down. Oh, I felt the same again. Oh, you're pr pretty sure it's either going to be gluten or tomatoes. And that way you can start to listen to the diet and start to say, okay, well for the next two to three weeks I'm going to take out gluten. Or it might be with eggs. Oh, for the next two to three weeks I'm going to take out eggs. Reintroduce it, listen to the body, and a lot of the time there's your answer. Um, the reason why I went and had sort of specific testing done again is because I wanted to find the really small things in my diet. Like, I've, he told me you shouldn't be eating gluten. Now my symptoms of gluten are really, really mild, but actually I think they were culminating in uh, cloudy vision, fatigue in my head. So I was going for a period where I thought I was just working a bit too much and I wasn't really feeling energized, I wasn't sharp, I wasn't having really clear decisions. 
and I've cut out, as of this, filming this right now, I've been gluten three again for three days and my mind has freed itself up to another level. I feel like I don't, I have way more mental clarity. So gluten was actually affecting me in a very different way. Now when I was younger, gluten affected me in terms of IBS and my skin. When I ate gluten, I had digestive, uh, digestive discomfort. So it was a very easy thing. So when I solved that or it stopped happening, I thought, oh, okay, I've solved the gluten problem. But it just slowly manifested itself in a different way, which was, was kind of like mental fatigue. And my mind is everything, or everyone's mind is everything. Like if you can't think clearly, you're not motivated to train as much, you don't have as good a relationship because you're not engaged, you kind of feel tired. I'm not productive at work because I can't think clearly. As a manager of other people and running a business, I can't make decisions based on clear thinking. It absolutely affects everything. So that's why I want to kind of reassess my health again and kind of jump forward again. And you're feeling way better, Loads better. At, just after a couple of days. Yeah, and I've got way less water retention as well. Nice. Like I've got, I was always like half a stone off looking really good and I seem to have dropped like four, four-ish pounds in terms of my look kind of within about three days. Like my abs have come out and everything. Nice. Not bad. But because my body fat was low, I didn't really question it. Yeah. Okay, well, we've got another another one, not as long, but still a wee bit longer. Uh, from Are you saying I'm waffling, Neil? No, no, not not answer wise. <laughs> They're uh, the questions are quite long winded. Um, this is from Eugene McClure. He's also one of the SFN ambassadors. Actually, I really aim to better myself, but also others along the way. My long term goal is to become a se- successful personal trader, not on how much money I can make, but on how many people's lives I can change for the better. So my question for you would be, what was the motivation for you to help and improve others as well as create your successful business? It was really simple in that because my weight loss journey was so powerful, after it was so difficult, so I spent five months really trying to lose weight, I'd lost five pounds, and on reflection I was like, this is depressing weight loss statistics, Like I should be losing weight way quicker. I went back to the drawing board, I then lost four stone in four months after getting in touch with a lot better information. And through that journey of putting so much effort in and then just tweaking a few things and getting incredible results, I was like, I need to share this information with other people. I can't keep it to myself. Like, because I had changed everything in my life. I became more confident, felt better in my clothes. I had more ambition. Like just everything changed by losing weight and feeling and looking better. And I thought, I can't not share this with everyone else. And that was just a a simple reason. And in terms of building a business, you know, building a following, building a podcast, I just felt that I have a good way to deliver information. I'm happy to sit on camera now and talk to people. I feel I can communicate well. And I thought, for me to waste that skill is just a waste. Mm. But So for me to communicate to more people... I need to build something bigger. Like it's not not enough for me to be in a gym and coach 20, 25 clients. I felt my mission was bigger. So I had to build a business where I could reach thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands of people, maybe in the future millions of people. Because if I'm gonna affect that much change, because I was so fired up about what I learned on my journey, then I need to create a bigger platform. And that was part of my impetus of building a bigger business and building stuff around me that can facilitate a bigger voice. Nice. So, do you think that the route that you took, a lot of it was down to being quite self-aware about where your talents lay as well? Yeah. yeah. And I think this is another favourite topic of mine, is, is self-awareness. So, we've talked about goals, stepping back, reevaluating already. And in that process, you've got to be massively self-aware. Like, I'm aware in that I'm confident, I'm happy on camera. That allows me to put in motion you know kind of marketing and you know things that allow me to use that attribute that I have now if you're not good at that you need to be self-aware enough to say do you know what I'm not good on video I'm not going to be as good as some of the other people out there but I'm really good at writing so actually my way to educate and inspire other people might be through writing I might write blogs and then I might write a book so you know wherever you're going and whatever you're trying to achieve with yourself 
you have to stand back and you have to look at your skill set, you have to look at your strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes it's good to work on certain weaknesses and sometimes you just gotta accept that that's not ever gonna be a strength of yours. There's weaknesses that I know of myself and I'm not gonna try and keep fighting on them. I'll improve some stuff, but as long as I'm aware of them, I can be tactical in working around my weaknesses to avoid slipping into, a, we'll call them traps, slipping into any personal traps and always going in the path of my strength so I can keep progressing with what our strengths and kind of character positives of mine. Audra McCory, um, biggest lesson learned during your time in the fitness industry? There's so many. Um, probably top of my head, be honest to yourself and be honest to the other people around you. Like be honest with your mission, your journey, what you're trying to achieve. It's the same with you know whether you're trying to lose fat. Be honest with yourself of why you're trying to go on that journey. What are the tangibles associated with that? With that, and there was a few points in my journey where I wasn't honest with myself. I didn't go back to my values, why I was doing things. Which you can we talked about this confessions podcast, which you can kind of get a hint of. I've got my confessions podcast part two coming up, which is going to kind of expand on this even more. And this is confession. The confession part two podcast is going to talk about some of the decisions that I made that I'm not happy with and why I made them and how it didn't align with my values and how I've tried to correct that with a, a kind of new project that I've got bubbling under the surface. Um, so during that time, I wasn't allowed to be true. I wasn't allowed to speak my voice you know, in a real true way because there was things behind me where I was like, actually, I haven't done that for the right reason. But because I'd made that choice and I'd gone down that route, I had to I had to ride it out. You can't just stop these things overnight. So I had to say, right, here's my year plan of how I'm going to get myself out of this position. And a lot of people might not have ever seen this, and they'll only maybe join some dots when I do this confession part two podcast. So I've had to go on a journey and learn to be really patient. And that's another thing with success at anything. You've got to be patient. You've got to be consistent. You've got to have resolve. Um, so I had to create a plan and have confidence in my confidence in my plan that when I get to the end of that, I'm going to be in a place where I can carry on being true. And I've learned that lesson that because I wasn't true to myself and because I didn't stick to what is really deep down in here, I've essentially potentially wasted two years of my life in in some aspects where I could have been moving forward if I'd just been true and really stood back and tried to be reflective and didn't let a couple of things derail my focus. And that's a hard lesson to take, but I'm only 29. And I'm glad that I've made them early on so that hopefully 30 to 40, 40 to 50, the, the kind of mistakes won't be um, enough to kind of derail me in my true mission. Mm -hmm. So so if you, if you make a decision um, and it's quite a big public decision that a lot of people can uh, can look back on you'll quite happily come out and say sorry I was wrong got it wrong and I've done that on part two of the podcast that you're talking about I'll do it on you know uh, sorry part one and I'll do it on part two you know for anyone to trust me for you to trust me to get on this show for people to trust me to follow my weight loss advice whatever it might be I've got to earn that trust and unless I'm not 100% honest then I shouldn't expect your trust People expect trust too easily when they put themselves in an education capacity. I put videos online, and just because I've put them online, I shouldn't expect that people are gonna trust me. I have to earn that trust. And I have to earn that trust by being honest, by being transparent. People can see that I'm doing things for the right reasons, that I'm passionate about the things that I talk about. And when I'm wrong, and I say something wrong, or I go on a path that is wrong, I'm willing to put my hand up and say, I was wrong about that. And this is what I'm going to do to make it up to you. And quite often I put out information and education to say, this is wrong and I'm now going to educate you on the process that I went through and how you can apply this to make sure that you do it in a positive way and it's a healthy thing going forward. Yeah, brilliant. And people that won't admit their faults don't deserve to be in any kind of position of influence, I don't think. Yeah. Because it's, it's unethical. Yeah. And we're living in an age where you can look back on everything you've ever said. Yeah. So if you're not going to yeah. debunk it now... No. And then, every, everything <laughs> that we say is now out there. 
Yeah. And that's the thing with technology. Like if I say something online, even if I delete it, there's probably a way to find it again. So everything that we say and do online is now trackable. So I obviously try and do the right thing initially, and when I do do the wrong thing, I just need to go back and be honest and correct my wrongdoing. So you're saying delete my history, it's not gone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sarah Ann says, do you have any plans to further promote, build or develop the Ditch the Diet brand? She went on to say that it was a, a really great resource. It was. So for anyone that doesn't know, Ditch the Diet is a concept similar to you know, things like Weight Watchers and other slimming clubs where we try to get groups of women in a room and educate them over time on how to eat, how to think, how to move, how to be happy. And we failed many, many times to get the concept right. Um, people don't want to know how to eat healthy. People don't want to be told that they're doing the wrong thing. People don't want to be told they're making the wrong decisions. Um, People don't want to be accountable for their own results. People honestly don't want to change. And we were trying to teach people in a room and the people that were receptive to our information made dramatic changes. But it wasn't enough to make the business successful enough to get momentum. So we've basically taken the program like offline, like there's not really anything happening in any other parts of the UK. And we're having to try and find a way that we can teach this information in a way that people will listen so we're trying to develop it in more of an online program at the moment the concept of ditching a diet for me is immensely powerful like getting out from the fact that you have to follow a certain set of rules and a, a very strict black and white framework to actually have success in health and fitness um, and i really want to get that message out there and it will happen one day i just haven't quite got it right so it will happen and if you want to find out what I'm talking about, then go to ditchthediet.uk.com, I think it is, um, and have a look, or it's on Facebook. But one day it will be out there, because I think there is a lot of women that could benefit from ditching the diet mentality. Did you have people actually meeting up already? Yeah, we had them in, like, you know, kind of groups. They'd come in, there'd be a room full of 20 people, they'd weigh themselves, they'd get educated uh, on, like, a seminar topic every week. So we might talk about how to build a diet, for example, for one week, uh, and then there'd be a, like a Q and A section, and the women would support themselves, and they'd talk about their challenges and their failures. But in that environment, there's just a huge amount of resistance. People don't want to change. They want to go to something like a Weight Watchers, be weighed, be comforted about the decisions that they're making, and it will all be okay. When we were standing in the room, going, being honest, and saying, no, actually, you can't binge on a weekend and do your diet Monday to Friday and expect results. You are gonna to have to change. You are gonna to have to sleep earlier. You are gonna to have to drink more water. You are gonna to have to eat more fruit and veg. And until people accept those realities of how to be healthy, people will not change. Awesome. And that was the problem with our program. So until I find a way to create greater change with this information, I can't put the program out there, but it will come out one day. So, final question. What are your plans at SFN Expo 2016? I'm doing, my big public seminar is going to be, I'm not 100% sure on the number, but I think it's going to be 25 reasons you're not losing fat. And I'm going to go over quick fire, it's going to be a really high energy presentation, all the reasons people are not losing body fat. And after that, people are not going to be able to make any excuses of why they're not realising their goals. Because if, you know, they've got even one of these 25 factors out of sync, then they need to they need to focus on that one thing. Um, I'll also be doing a talk on the personal training stage. Um, what that topic is yet, I don't know. Uh, we'll think about it closer to the time, depending on what I kind of really want to get out there in terms of education. And then I'll also be around the expo, trying to meet as many people as possible. You know, grab some selfies with some awesome people, uh, and generally kind of connect and communicate with everyone that's going to come. Brilliant, awesome, and I'm excited. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I went really high pitched there. It's like, like my, uh, I'm not going to use the term. If, uh, if you have anybody else that you want to be on the Ask SFN show, drop it in the comments if you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, tag the person. So, And also use hashtag Ask SFN show on Twitter and Instagram. We'll find your suggestions and your questions. As for me, I've been Neil McLean, you've been Vancouver, see you at SFN.